Hi, yeah. So a couple of months ago, you might remember we were down at a private recording studio doing a recording with a friend of mine, Carl Brazil, and um, we're back at Gospel Oak Studios, uh, where I normally work, doing a little mix, and I thought it might be quite interesting to go through some of the individual elements of the drum kit, where for once you can actually hear what we've done. So um, that was a little bit of the mix playing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to solo up the kit and um, just have a listen to how the kit stands um, as it was recorded. So it's pretty nice punchy sound. Um, Individual elements wise, I'll go through what we used on the, uh, the drums. Now, after this part of the video, we're going to do the walkthrough that we recorded on the day where I go a bit more into detail about all of the different microphones used and my reasons behind it. But in this instance, um, I'm just going to start by uh, soloing up a few things so you get to, to hear it. So um, there'll be a bit of repetition because I'm going to talk about what mics we've used now. Um, but um, let's just have a listen. So on the kick drum, We've got a pair of mics, Beta 91 and an Audix D6, and they sound like this. And you can hear there's quite a bit of rejection. You're still hearing some, um, some of the rest of the kit in there, but um, that, that's nothing to be feared. Um, it's quite a nice full sound. The D6 is providing us with the, the girth of the, of the kick drum and the Beta 91 is giving us the, the punch and attack. So um, I'll bring in the snare um, just on its own, which uh, this is the top snare. Now this was um, uh, Bayer 201 and an AKG 414, both right next to each other and phase checked. 414 picking up more of the overall sound of the shell the 201 picking up the stick attack. Um, they were bust down to one track and got, they've gone through a little bit of EQ on the way down and a 456 tape compression unit. So that sounds like this. As it stands, it's actually quite nice. I'm just gonna see if I had any EQ on it. Yeah, so, um, in the mix, I'm actually going to pop a little bit of EQ in just to give it a slight bit more brightness. And I'm also going to give it a, a little amount of gating. Um, so this is with, without the EQ and then I'll pop it in. And without. And back in. So when I pull back uh, the, the kick and put that in, we get a nice solid kick and snare. Now the only reason I'm just putting a little bit of EQ is because the mix needs it. I just want to get rid of some of that, um, uh, the spill from the rest of the kit because I'm going to have plenty of mics doing that. But you can hear even without it, they're a pretty nice couple of, um, of drum sounds. Then the undersnare mic, which is a KM84, sounds like this. Which is standard undersnare mic. Now if I bring this in underneath the, uh, the top snare mic, you'll hear the effect of the pair of them. And some might argue it doesn't actually even need the EQ on the top mic, that, that's without that on there. So again, there's plenty of scope here, which is, uh, which is what I'm going for. I'm looking for a really natural, tight, punchy sound that works well within the context of this, the tune in the end. There's loads of stuff I can do with EQ without it sounding fake. Um, moving on, um, I've got the, uh, the toms, which I just need to find and I need to, need to locate a section where the toms are actually doing something. So we've got a little section here. So I explained in the video that I've used Sennheiser 604's top and bottom um, to pick up the attack and the tone of the drum, phase reversed at source. 
they're picking up less symbols than would normally be the case with just a top mic because they're rejecting all the symbol wash from the outside because of the phase reversal that's going on. This is flat at the moment. I'll just find my tracks on here. Um, so this is as they're recorded. So what I'll do is I'll now play them with a little bit of gating and a bit of EQ on them so that we're actually rejecting a little bit more of the overall sound of the kit. I want them to punch through. So here's the toms without any of that, just as they were recorded. Which they're punching through nicely, but if I pop in a channel strip with a bit of uh, an expander on it, the overall ambience will drop down and they'll sound even more punchy. Now we can hear the gate, that's fine, it's working the way a gate should, but if I play all the drums together... We're not getting any chattering from it. So again, they're doing their work in the track, as they should. Um, moving on, I went on to overheads, so... In the video, you'll see that I use a center pair of overheads, which were on this occasion AKG 451s, small diaphragm condensers. I've used them in an AB formation so that I'm rejecting a bit of the snare because you can hear I've already got quite a lot of very coherent snare. So they sound like this. Um, and again, um, let me just prep the tracks. Um, Without any EQ on them, they sound as recorded. That's kind of what you'd expect. It's a picture of the centre part of the kit. Now I've got two outriggers further out, which are again 451s. They'll, they'll cover the symbols that these aren't covering. But you can hear that when the symbols hit, they, they pop out nicely. But there's still a little bit of a drum kit sound about the overheads, which again, I don't really want. So what I'm gonna do is I'll play it without the EQ and then I'll pop a bit of EQ in, so. And then out. So I'm looking for a bit of definition. I'm, I'm working the, the elements together. If I go back in and put in my snare and my kick, you'll hear that we've got plenty, if I go far enough down the desk, um, we've got plenty of um, uh, kick somewhere down here. It's even further. Uh, there we go. So my symbols are popping through. If I take out the EQ, it just gets a little bit more, I don't know, roomy-like. This is without. An EQ back in. All becomes a little bit more defined. Um, I'll move through the other overhead tracks just so you hear and we don't need to worry about the whys and wherefores of EQing. Um, in fact I'm not actually using any EQ on the other uh, the other overheads. So this is the centre overheads again. And then the wide overheads. And together we get this. which sounds like a nice coherent picture of the whole kit. There's plenty of work that we can do with those. Um, they fit nicely within the context of the mix. Uh, 
Again, they're four five ones. Um, so we've got four of the same mic covering an area. There doesn't sound like there's any phase problems going on with it. Um, we were incredibly um, fastidious making sure that we were careful with measuring distances and listening um, as with everything. Basically, when I bring up faders, nothing changes. Into, it's just the microphones get louder. We don't get any phase issues. Um, I think I'm on a part where there's a right symbol, so let's have a look. Uh, again, this is a 451. So that's quite a good one to illustrate. If I take out the 451, we're getting the right symbol in there, but it's not defined. So the whole purpose of this right symbol, mic is to define that position. Which is, you probably notice most of my faders are up at zero or thereabouts because I recorded the sound I wanted. Um, we used to say, get the levels to tape. That's what I'm doing there. Um, so that, that was, again, 451. Over to the hats, um, I'm pretty sure um, this is an Audio-Technica 4033. I think we're in, a sim in the right area, although I may just have to find a bit with hats in it. Let's try this. So nice, decent rejection of all the other stuff. There's a little bit of snare in there. I've picked up the sound of the hats that I like. So if I call up the overheads without the hats. It's in there. If I bring the hi-hat in, it just defines our position more. It's a nice crisp sound. Without it, it just doesn't define itself so well. So. That's all, us almost done. Um, over the kit, we've got two four five ones high up, just spaced about that far apart. It's almost a, a um, it's on a stand that could be described as a decatree stand. It's like three microphones. We're only using two, but they're so far away they're just picking up room. So I'm gonna just play the overhead mics or the overhead top room mics, and they sound like this. And you can hear they're not that wide. They're creating some room. They're too far away to be very stereo. Um, within the kit sound, they make a huge difference. So this is the whole kit. And then with those, and without, makes a massive difference to the depth of the sound. Um, now with the with the snare I do like to put a couple of little reverbs in so if I just show you what I'm doing with the reverbs they just add a little bit of texture that is different to a room sound so I have a, an ambient reverb on the snare to help with this. A bit more carry and then uh, another reverb for the for the the parts of the song where I feel it just wants to be a little bit more explosive. You don't tend to notice them so much once the track's playing, but they help again bring it together. So with the reverbs and those room mics, and then our final candidates are the two room mics that were further away up on the balcony facing the kit. They were in a Bloom line configuration. Um, and they were a pair of reissue for uh, U47s. They sound like this. So we're getting the forward part of the kit. We're getting the snare hitting us a bit more. They're, they're a bit more, I'd almost say boxy sounding, but the room isn't boxy sounding. So they add in this element, which is kind of cool. Um, if I take them out. just something that cuts in the track a bit more. So once we've got all those elements together, um, it's just a case of sitting them into the mix. And if I take everything out of solo, we're back into the, um, into the realms of how everything sits.
which is doing the job for me. So hopefully that's been useful for you. Um, we're going to do the walk round where Carl and I discuss a few things um, and you'll actually see some of the reasons behind what we did on the day. The kick and snare are kind of the dominant sounding drums that dictate where the track's going production-wise. A snare can change the whole sonics of a track, as we've just experienced. Some people think the kick drum is the, is the most resonant uh, part of the kit, but it's actually the floor tom for me. So what I do, and we've, we've done this a couple of times, um, is I'll take the floor tom and I'll walk around like a little drummer boy. It's just about finding a space where it doesn't sound crap. You actually said to me, the floor tom is ringing out, and the floor tom, if, if it's not dampened properly or tuned properly, is the one drum that rings out by, with every other drum. Yeah. Uh, it's the last thing to, it always has the last word. So the, the, in order to get rid of that, I don't like smothering drums in dampening because you lose the character and the tone. So I tighten the bottom head so it loses a bit of its air. And sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. But uh, it's not rocket science, but it works on this yes. particular rig. In terms of actual parts of the kit, um, I try to cover as many bases as possible with a kick drum. I mean, you won't be able to see either of them unless Mike gets close-up shots, but I, I like to get two characteristics on a kick drum. I want the attack of the beater and the punch, and then I want the, the subbiness and the actual tone of the kick drum. So I, I always cover it with two mics. Um, on this occasion, the ones that won out were a Beta 91, which is like the PZM looking thing inside. And then I've got an Audix D6, which just won the day today. Um, and they're moved around. We do a lot of backwards and forwards, moving stuff until it sounds right, because I want the phase relationship between the, the mics to be good. Because I'm printing those down to one track through a 456, which gives me that tape saturation thing. Um, they sound great. The, the kick is full fat, it's a slowish track with quite a lot of articulation, so we need the punch, the attack and the weight. Can I hit it? Yeah. <sighs> Doesn't sound like anything like that in the No, mix. well, funny, <laughs> enough, funny enough, where I sit, if I lean back, yeah, you get it. I can hear the depth, because when I'm tuning it, yeah. if, I, if I go here and it's got a bit of resonance and it's, it's weighty, yeah. I know I'm, I've got the right yeah. spot, then no one can blame me and so that doesn't sound right. Oh, I wish we'd known. Um, so on the snare, same thing. I, I want to look at, um, I want to pick up the, where the stick hits. I want to hear that attack of the stick. It's the paper, it's the, that, that, that smack. Yeah. Yeah, and then I want the tone of the drum. And so I use, um, in this case, it's a Bayer 201, which is a hypercardioid. So that really focuses on, it's got lots of proximity effect. And I stick a 414 next to it, a large diaphragm condenser. Um, generally, whatever's available. Um, if there hadn't been a 414, I'd have used something else. It would have been a large diaphragm condenser, but it would have been that combination. They're, again, positioned next to each other and moved until they sound as good as possible. They need to sound like they're working in tandem. They're bust down again through a 456, straight to um, a, a channel. So we've now got one kick mic, one snare, or one kick track, one snare track. So that takes care of the main two elements, but we want to pick up the actual snare. So underneath I've got a condenser, a little KM84. These are, none of these are new mics. They're, they're just stalwarts. Um, reason I use a condenser under the snare is because I want to pick up the sizzle. It's, if you've only got 57s, you can get a great sound with it. But if you want to, actually get some articulation and there's a hell of a lot of press rolls and ghost notes going on with this. You want to hear the, sn the snares rattle and have that choice. On the desk, I think I'm, I'm EQing the, the, the SM91 I'm putting EQ on and I'm putting a little bit of top end on the 414. Those, that and the two toms are the only mics that have got any EQ on them at the moment. It's all done by choice and placement. So I'm not against EQing, it's just worked out brilliantly because we've got a good kit, a good drummer and a um, you know good sounding mics. So that gets me my my sound from the snare that I like. Obviously top and bottom 
Uh, for the engineering interested, you have to flip the phase of the bottom mic because um, when he hits the skin, the top skin's going away from the top mic and the bottom skin's going towards the bottom mic, so you have to flip the phase so they sound coherent. Um, if you flip the phase and it sounds worse, then the wiring's wrong in the studio. I've started putting a mic pointing at the beta of the kick drum underneath the snare, and it just seems to tie in the two drums nicely. Again, it makes you sort your phase out because now you've got things that are working in tandem. Um, and that just gives us a little bit more, I don't know, just it gels the two together. Some people come, look, you didn't know that. You'd have, you'd have kicked it, wouldn't you? Some people bring in a, like a 201 here, um, known as the crotch mic or the sausage, the Wurst in Germany. Um, and it just does the same thing. It's like this, this mic, I don't compress it. I don't, I don't want to look for dirt and distortion. I'm looking for fidelity and power. Um, Toms, I use a technique which uses cheap uh, Sennheiser 604s, clip-ons top and bottom, uh, means I have to use less stands. Um, while he's moving his, his kit around, the mics just sit there. They sound great. Tom, the Tom sound we've got. Tom sound huge, don't they? Massive, huge. So what I do with it is, again, it's a similar thing to the snare. How, how much sound comes from the bottom head? Loads. It's it's, a lot of the time. It, it, it dominates yeah. the kit if you, if you don't look after it. Yeah, so you, you get a well-tuned tom. Um, I use this cable. All this does is on um, the top, uh, the top just goes straight through. The bottom one is polarity reversed. So I now have a single mic line going into the control room that has two mics, phase reversed, and when he hits the drum, it picks up both parts really, really nicely. Um, it works. I don't have any problem on any kit I've ever done it on in the last 20 years. I haven't needed to turn the bottom tom mic down or any of this stuff. They just work together. They take EQ brilliantly. Um, some people say the Sennheiser 421 is the best tom mic ever. Not when you've got low cymbals. These things are great. Um, I get the sound I like and the byproduct of miking this way is because they're picking up the sound of the room and the, all the ambience. Because they're out of phase with each other, when, you, when it goes into the control room, the ambience is still going into both mics, but the bottom one's phase reverse, so you get a cancellation of all the ambience. So I have tom tracks that look like this until the tom hits, and you get these beautiful, lovely, big tom sounds that don't have a load of cymbals over them. And you can really feature them, you can EQ them, you can make them sound huge. I'm a big Tom fan. If you're going to mic up a kit and, and have a rock drum or a pop drum or whatever, it's, you've got to make the whole kit sing. So I'm quite passionate about those. And it also does work with condenser mics because of the way that Phantom Power works. So anybody that's criticised me on forums before, you're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. The rest of the kit, it's really, really straightforward. I like using uh, AKG 451s. These. These are um, a slightly older model, these are newer. They're just a lovely um, overhead mic. The reason I've gone for this in the middle is I like to get a picture of the kit. I don't particularly want too much snare in it because I've already covered the snare sound and I generally end up pulling uh, the snare out of the overheads. I want detail from the cymbal. So I've gone for the center line of the kit, which is through the kick and the snare and I've just tried to cover around here, rejecting a bit of the snare. And then because Carl's setup is quite wide, I've just gone either side with a pair of outriggers, which gives me complete coverage on the cymbals. Every time he hits a cymbal, I want to be able to feature that. And I want to just, even if I have to automate a hit, I want it to all be coherent in phase. So um, that's kind of it, in, except for the hi-hat, which is important. Um, there was a lot of stuff going on on forums and a lot of people who think it's clever not to mic up a hi-hat. Funnily enough, before he says it, yesterday the hi-hat mic ended up... Listen, I thought it was one of my cases. <laughs> <laughs> techniques no, I, I'm not get involved. I hadn't actually tightened up the stand and it ended up down here. Fortunately, we weren't doing a take. I've got to be honest, um, now you're onto overheads and stuff, can I go? <laughs> <laughs> well, don't they matter? <laughs> All that stuff, because you actually changed out symbols as well, didn't you? I did actually, you... but I, joking aside, when I saw this a bit further away yesterday, yeah. I thought... He's mental. Because everyone's got their own techniques, yeah. everyone I've worked with does things in it a different way. It would have picked it up. 
Um, one other thing that you may notice, I mean, we've had to take a slightly different approach with that one, um, but most of my mics are facing in the same direction. So again, you get the, whatever's happening is this projection of, of sound, the energy is heading in that direction. We're picking them up. It just helps with the phase coherency again. Um, I love your attention to detail because we did walk in the room today and you stood there and you went, has that dipped? Yeah. And the tape measure came out and you were right. Well, it wasn't a tape measure. I'm not well, that well, I am It was a laser measure. It, it, no, it was. I, no, I was just. I was. I was pretty sure that mic wasn't wasn't where I left it. So, I just took. A, Again, we know who was. <sighs> yeah, yeah. The fairies are coming overnight. But it's just if if you can change something while you're recording, you don't have those pangs of regret later when you go. Oh, I wish I'd changed that. Everybody's pro, they know that if something's wrong, you, you never shout cut on a director unless you're about to blow all the pyro on a movie set. It's that kind of thing. So if you think something's wrong, you stop. Even if they're in the flow, you go, I'm really sorry, but I think that mic is now touching, that's drooped, something's not right, your snare's dropped in tuning, something isn't right, can we fix it? Because you can't fix later. And we've got some amazing drum tracks and bass tracks that, you know, it took, what, a couple of hours when you got going? Yeah, I, I just, you just made me remember, I did a, a particular track once, and I think I was really happy with my drum take, and I thought, yes, I've just nailed it, and I looked at the snare mic, and it was on the snare. Oh. And I thought, do I say anything? Can I pull that off again? And we listened back to it, and uh, it was only touching it, it must have just happened right at the end, but I was just praying that it was okay, because that can happen, can't it? It can. It can and those are the kinds of things that if it, if it wasn't um, able to be done again, the engineer would have to deal with it. Right. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's, nobody's out looking to be, uh, nobody's gonna be judged or criticized. If you, if you just keep the attention to detail, as you say, you yeah. just make sure that you do everything as much as you can, walk backwards and forwards into the room. You have fun then. A, a friend of mine, Bob Marlette, um, he, uh, when I first met him, he said, how are the backups going to be done on this project? I went, oh, I've got two drives here and I'm going to do that. He goes, great, let's not turn fun into tears. And it's just simply, it sticks with you because it's like you get your shit together, everybody can then have fun and, um, and we've had a great time. We really have. Today's been it's really... It's time for an afternoon nap now. Really smooth. Time for a beer or something. <laughs> but it's been great. It's been real fun. Yeah, I've enjoyed it too. Really so um, hopefully that's given you an insight. This is probably a three-parter now. Um, and um, we'll be back, uh, back at some point in the future.